Okay, attention please. So thanks everybody for coming. Uh, we are very pleased that you have Dr. David Santin here to give us a talk about the energy applications. Actually, his research really spans a wide range. This is just one part of that. So, uh, Dr. David Santin is Canada Research Chair in Integrated Microfluidics and Nanofluidics. I'll turn to it. sounds more smart. Yeah, I just don't like it. Uh, yeah, he got his bachelor from University of Toronto and I went to McGill for his master and I came back to Toronto for his PhD under Professor Dong Ching Lee. We were lab mates together, did our PhD crazily together. So now he's uh, now also associate professor in the mechanical department at University of Victoria. Oh, his research, he got lots and lots of awards, I'll name a few of them. Uh, one is uh, for the Douglas Colton uh, from CMC. And he also got the Smith Award from uh, uh, Canadian Society in 2006. And in 2007, he got a Teaching Excellence Award, covered both teaching and research. And he also got an Early Career Achievement Award, awarded by the University of Toronto, recognized that alumni achievement uh, when they go for their career. Uh, of course, he got a Canada Research Chair, I think last year or the year before. That's right. Yeah, so it's a, he has done a lot, and he published 60 journal articles over about seven years. Uh, that's really amazing. He do biomedical applications, he do the energy applications, microfluidic fuel cell, and I would do lots of things, uh, doing the sensor things. Now he is a visiting scholar and also a junior professor in Cornell University. So I'll leave the rest of time to David. Well, uh, thanks very much. It's a very nice uh, introduction. Um, I have. Uh, it's great to be here, and of course, I have many fond memories from uh, from working with uh, Dr. Ren before she was Dr. Ren, and uh, and of course in in, uh, in Professor Lee's lab. So, uh, yeah, great uh, professional motivation to be here, and also uh, nice from personal perspective. Typically, microfluidics research has developed for biomedical applications. So, some familiar things um, that. Uh, that, uh, that groups have worked on. These are examples from, from my work, but I think there's several groups uh, here at Waterloo that could have a similar slide, different pictures, but same idea. Um, so we've done you know, work in, in, uh, in looking at fundamental properties of, of microfluidic flows, electrokinetics uh, flows are of interest particularly for uh, biomedical kind of separations. You know, you could do uh, mixing, whoops, pardon me. You can do uh, uh, different mixing processes and and separation process. There was a lot of work in that in, in the early years, I guess, of microfluidics. More recently, we've looked at um, building microfluidic reactors to do, um, to do some, <coughs> something on the, on the nanoscale. So this is a case of, of building nanoscale particles using, uh, using microfluidic reactors. And it's actually some interesting top-down um, dynamics you can get, especially we found in, uh, in these two-phase reactors. They have really high shear points here in the corners. And, and lots of and lots of mixing, so you can really get uh, structures of nanoparticles. In these cases, this is, this is uh, biomarker kind of stuff. They're quantum dots inside those particles. So you can get some nice structures and nice control for microfluidics on that end. The nanofluidics side of things, you get some interesting charge dynamics that don't show up in the micro scale, and uh, and you can also do lots of interesting sensor work. So um, the uh, the nano length scale shares uh, shares a length scale with with the with visible light. So there's some interesting dynamics there, and that can be used for sensing. There's lots of interesting work going on here at Wynn um, in, uh, in that area. And the optofluidic side, so optical fluidics is a combination of optics and fluidics. Um, essentially, optics have been used for fluidics for a long time. No one ever looked at a microchip without using a microscope. But uh, the idea behind optofluidics is that, is that uh, they're, they're integrated in a bit more... Um, uh, they're integrated a bit more tightly in the sense that the optics is used to control the fluidics or the fluidics is used to control the optics. So some simple examples, you can push some particles around in a chip using light forces. Um, you can use fluids to manipulate optics. So this is a kind of a cute example we did of, you can picture these two fluid uh, collaminar streams. They're out of plane and independent control. So you can picture drawing basically a pixel around. So you get a fluidic photo mask, which is kind of neat. So fluids controlling optics, and then this, this is a sensor, oops, pardon me, we've spent a lot of time with these nanohole arrays. They're neat to me because they're photonic sensors, so we use them for, for um, amino assay kind of sensing on the bio end, but they're also holes, so they're channels. 
So a mechanical guy that's into transport, like myself, can get excited about how we can get enhanced transport inside the holes. So this is, this is sort of an, an overview of our biomedical applications. I decided today in, in talking with Dr. Wren that it might, be, um, it might be interesting for me to present some of my energy-related research, because primarily because it's a bit different. There's, there's, I guess, less or very few, almost none, microfluidics researchers working in the, in the energy side. So the, uh, the recent past in fluidics for energy systems, I got started looking at fuel cell technologies. There's two different areas there that were of interest. One is microfluidic fuel cells, and the other one is, is current problems in, in hydrogen fuel cells. So in microfluidic fuel cells, this is a relatively early invention on 2002, and uh, the idea is that you have these two streams that, uh, that flow together, and uh, in, in the lab on chip world, that was some early work. People said, oh, this isn't good because the streams don't mix very, very well, right? And we want mixing for chemical reactions, that sort of thing. So people went to work, we went to work in lots of groups on making better mixing processes. But this case, this actually uses that aspect as a separation of fuel and oxidant. Traditional fuel cells, you gotta have fuel, you gotta have an oxidant, you gotta keep them from mixing, and you gotta give them both an electrode, basically. So this, this um, allows for the, the basically membraneless operation. So using a laminar flow to separate the, uh, the fuel and oxidant. So I'll, I'll walk you through a bunch of our uh, work there and, and, and what we learned from that. On the, on the hydrogen fuel cell end, that's another case where you've got, um, you've got transport related issues, specifically because they produce water. So we'll talk a little bit about those those technologies. And that's a case where we use microfluidics, all the tools that many microfluidics for biomedical applications people have developed, and we can apply them to, to an energy problem uh, and get some traction. At present, I'm transitioning a little bit from these. I've got some ongoing work here, to be sure, but uh, I guess a sabbatical year and is a good time to think about where you're going next. And, uh, and before this year as well, I've been sort of looking at different directions. So that's the future side of this talk. Um, some big problems in energy, which may not be obvious places where microfluidics could make a contribution, are in uh, carbon management and in, uh, in biofuel production. So this is where I think there's a lot of potential, and, uh, and I'll show you some of my future concepts and some of the stuff that we're working on uh, right at this moment. I've never given a talk exactly like this. It's very uh, much an overview of these methods, but I hope you come away from this with an idea that, um, that your research in small scale stuff, maybe it's not microfluidics, but maybe there's applications out there beyond sensors and beyond, uh, beyond chips that, that might be worth looking at. So first stop, the microfluidic fuel cells. So I mentioned how these two have, uh, have these two streams that flow together, right? And you can get reactions, see a nice boundary layer there developing. You get reaction on both the anode and the cathode, and what's not shown here is a load, so you, get a, you connect this up and you put a load there, and you get, uh, you get energy conversion. So this, is a, this was an early design. You can see it, you know, it worked reasonably well. It was, it was uh, certainly um, uh, effective, but there's lots of problems here, right? The, um, the power density was low. Uh, the fuel utilization was low. What's that mean? It means we're throwing out a lot of fuel here and a lot of oxidant. If we slow down the flow or increase the length here, we can get more, but of course we've got, we've got mixing going on at the same time scale, so that's a challenge. And then how do you stack this? How do you, how do you make, you've got a neat little thing on a chip, but how do you make a device out of that, right? It doesn't seem that you can stack a bunch of these PDMS layers together and really make something that produces a significant amount of power. So these are the practical uh, challenges with this technology. So that's where we stepped in in about uh, 2005. We focused primarily on vanadium fuel cells. And why do we choose vanadium? Um, lots of reasons. It's basically uh, a redox system and it's well balanced on each side. So the fuel and oxygen side, it's basically five plus, vanadium five plus on one side, vanadium two plus on the other, and you convert them down into three and four plus. It's all liquid. There's no gaseous products. Um, if you've got this nice laminar flow set up and, and it's working, and then one of your products of your reaction is, is a nice big bubble of oxygen or CO2, then that's a problem, right? It's going to disturb your flow. Some other aspects, well-balanced half cells, electrolytic regeneration. There's lots of reasons to use vanadium. One of them that's not entirely obvious when you get started is that it's cheap. This is something that comes up, I find, more in energy systems 
than in uh, sort of nanobio for, uh, for biomedical applications. I don't think anyone really cares um, for some of the stuff we've done in sensors. I don't think anyone is really that fussy that they're really expensive to make. They're really expensive to make, but it's no big deal for us. But ultimately, that might limit their, their application, but it's not worried about the same. In, in, in energy systems, I find that the, the cost aspects are a bit more um, what's the word, of concern. So, uh, so low cost is important. So these use uh, carbon electrodes, and carbon is really cheap. And you can get it in all sorts of forms. So we worked at looking at producing carbon electrodes in different ways. And you can imagine carbon paste and all that stuff. Um, but I had a student at the time that was, that was trying to figure this out. And he was sketching away with a pencil. And of course, a graphite rod from a pencil is a, uh, is a carbon rod, right? And he checked the conductivity. And sure enough, it was quite suitable. So, so we started out with this just using carbon. <laughs> Um, graphite rods. So these are literally pencil leads from the U University of Victoria bookstore. And you can, you know, you can, you can put these into polyurethane and uh, shave them down and you get a nice, both, uh, it's both a catalyst for the reaction and a current collector. So that's kind of neat, right? So it's a similar kind of cell as before. How did this work? Um, reasonably well. For microfluidic fuel cells, you always want to plot things. Peak power is important. And then, and then versus flow rate. So obviously, you jack up the flow rate. It's like pushing the gas down. You can get more, more power, right? But what happens, as we saw before, just because of those transport issues, as you increase the flow rate, your fuel utilization, just your efficiency, goes right down. So you're basically, at this stage, you're getting nice power, but you're not getting much, uh, you're not using much of your fuel. You're throwing it in the garbage. It's not very efficient. So you have to operate at low, at low uh, flow rates for, for the, um, high efficiency. So sticking with this rod uh, theme, we thought, well, this is kind of a unique, it's not a catalyst layer that you're putting on top of a piece of gold in a chip, right? It's actually a rod, it's a structure. So could we build something, like we build a new fuel cell architecture around it? So that's where this guy came up. It's kind of a neat uh, concept. The idea is an array of rods. So it's a microfluidic fuel cell in the sense that the spacing between these is, is small. So there's no, there's no turbulent mixing or anything like that. So you still have microfluidic flow here. But it's the first example of a microfluidic fuel cell that's scalable. You could make this pretty big, right? Uh, and, uh, and maintain the, the, the properties uh, of the, that, that the microfluidics provides. How did this compare to the other one? Um, reasonably well, I would say. Certainly we're getting up here. So 78% uh, fuel utilization. This is unheard of uh, at the time in, uh, in microfluidic fuel cells. So that's certainly a positive. We still have this effect of, you know, we get the good efficiency, but only at slow speeds. Part of the reason why we focus on fuel cells, or initially focused on fuel cells, is because it's a surface area gain, right? For microfluidics and nanofluidics and, and nanoscience in general, I would argue, you can't win games that aren't that aren't at least um, biased towards surface as opposed to volume technologies. So an example, I promise you that there will never be uh, a really impressive example of a microscale internal combustion engine, right? Because that's a volume technology. When you have a Mustang, you say it's a five liter Mustang, it's not a four meter squared Mustang, right? It's a volume that matters in an engine. In fuel cells, it's surface area. So that's a case where small scale where this high surface to volume ratio can make an impact. So if we, if we transition from graphite rods to something smaller, like porous um, carbon paper, two orders of magnitude, can we see some significant benefit? So the first step there is to build a cell like we did before, um, but use porous electrodes and, uh, and see the effect. We did some nice theory here. I'm not going to take you through it, but as far as the penetration depth, how far does, if you, if you flow fluid over top of this porous electrode, of course I would like this stuff to go right down in there and react. How much does? Well, the answer is some, but for those of you who are familiar with the fluid mechanics at this scale, not much. Okay, not much penetrates down in there. Nonetheless, we saw, we saw increased performance, and, uh, and we're sort of hitting some, some higher targets here. So the first microfluidic fuel cells that came out um, were kind of maximum, usually around 10 and 1, and then uh, pushing up to 30 maximum. So we're getting up there, that's for sure making some improvements. So the performance has improved, but um, the fuel utilization is still limited at high power density. So how do we improve that? Essentially, it's a, it's, at this level, it's a transport problem, right? So if we have another look at this, at this fuel cell, 
we've got all this great surface area, and we know that's a, that's a thing that nanosystems, microsystems, that's what we're good at. So we'd like to get, and I got all this fuel up here, and I want to push that down in there so it reacts. Let's oxygen over here, I want to push that down in there so it reacts. So I think it's fairly obvious in a sense when you look at this slide, and uh, this slide probably undermines my research a little bit because it does look very obvious, but the thing to do is to, is to not design it this way, but to, but to push that, that reactant right through the porous media in, in the first place, right? So the, um, this cell was, uh, we got a lot of traction out of this concept, it's relatively simple, but uh, it provided um, class leading power densities and, and fuel utilization. So again, the concept is just to, just to utilize that high surface area. Vanadium's got this interesting property that's convenient uh, to work with. It has uh, these, these two different species. This isn't dye. This is uh, the actual native um, color of, of that species of vanadium, and then likewise on the black side. So you can actually see what you've got here. So in this case, the fuel cell's not operating. There's no, like, there's no um, current being taken from the electrode. So you've just got this flow through the porous electrode here, and then out in a collaminar flow like we'd seen before. When we can connect the fuel cell, we can automatically see that we're getting fairly significant, um, uh, whoops, fairly significant uh, consumption of fuel and oxygen here. This is basically a uniform stream, the color that we'd expect from the middle redox species. So how did this look from a, from a numbers perspective? The power density was uh, 130 milliwatts per centimeter squared, so that's higher, that's 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared higher than any previous uh, attempt, and then it remains the, the best uh, for, for the microfluidic fuel cell class. So that's, that was positive. And then on the, on the fuel utilization end, certainly some, uh, some benefits. So you can see here sort of a practical operating range where we can have, our, have reasonable power density, not high, not super high, but we're, we're getting relatively high fuel utilization. So it's getting closer to being what could be a practical device. One last aspect I'll mention about this cell and this cell architecture is the, uh, the in-situ regeneration. Any previous microfluidic fuel cell, if you try to run it, run it backwards, try to recharge it, send the flow back in the waste and, and, and apply a voltage to the electrodes, try to generate the constituents, it's not going to work. But in this one, because of the design, we can go, uh, we can basically run this in reverse and, uh, and generate, you can see a boundary layer developing of the one redox species. So that's, that's uh, what I think a, a sellable aspect of this technology. So we walked through a bunch of different incarnations of the microfluidic uh, fuel cell and uh, we reviewed this stuff in, in 2009 and an obvious question um, sort of comes up at the end which is what's looking at all of this what's next what could be better and one thing that's striking is this cell is obviously the best by a long shot but there's relatively large relatively deep area here and, and there's also ohmic losses are significant. So you can picture a cell that's, that's the same concept, flow through the electrode, but, but takes away advantage of a much, a much smaller uh, porous layer. But the only way to do that is to apply uh, nanofabrication. So that's something we're looking at um, right now, and I'm currently on sabbatical leave, and I'm working with the Ericsson Group. So that's been a project that's been, that we've been working on uh, together. And the idea is this, this stack with these, uh, these manifold plates. It looks similar, to those of you who are familiar with hydrogen fuel cells, it looks similar, but it's conceptually um, backwards, I guess. Um, but this, the idea here is this manifold plate provides a fuel and or the oxygen to each side of a porous membrane. And this guy we can manufacture from, uh, you know, flexing the muscle of, of, of nanotechnology methods, fabrication methods, we can manufacture this in polymer and then carbonize it to, uh, to uh, carbon. So this work is ongoing. It's, kind of, it's a neat cell architecture, and, uh, and I think it has, it has promise. This is an example of a, of a, of a membrane that's fabricated and then uh, and carbonized. The, uh, it's a little bit confusing, this cell geometry, and you may not uh, get it straight, but the idea is the, flow, uh, the fuel flows in around these manifolds, out through the porous layer, right, and then and then out through waste. So waste and oxygen streams are, are, uh, are sandwiched by the, by the waste streams. So it's, it's, a, it's a neat incarnation, and I think it's probably, uh, probably going to take the advantages of the other systems and, and, uh, and uh, combine them. 
on the hydrogen fuel cell end, there's existing problems with, microfluidic, with, uh, with hydrogen fuel cells. So microfluidic fuel cells, I, I put those in a category of new devices that microfluidics and nanofluidics brought about. This is an existing problem that has been around a long time that microfluidics can help solve. So there's two, different, there's two different ways to look at that, and I'll give you two future examples that we're working on now. Similarly, one's a device that is enabled by microfluidics, and one is a problem that exists that maybe can be helped by using microfluidic tools. In this case, uh, hydrogen fuel cells, just give you a one minute overview of, of how these things uh, work. These are gas diffusion layers, these similar sort of porous matrix that we saw earlier. Why do they use that in a big fuel cell? Well, because it's got lots of surface area. I should mention um, Amy Basilak. I can't see the top corner of the slide here very well. Uh, Amy is a student that is, that, uh, that, um, is responsible for a lot of the work we did in this, in this area. And I, and I should have mentioned back there was a, there was a picture of, of Eric Xi'an. And uh, Eric's now at uh, developing that work in his own research program at Simon Fraser University. And Amy's working on this and related stuff um, uh, at University of Toronto. So if we connect a load to this fuel cell, we're going to produce water. And many people use that feature to sell hydrogen fuel cells. Oh, your, your gas-powered uh, automobile produces all the carbon dioxide, which is greenhouse gas. That's really bad. My fuel cell only produces water. It's really good. Yeah, that's good. But the bad news is it produces water inside this microstructure. And then that's really hard to get out. So that becomes, the, the, they basically, the better a fuel cell works, the more water it produces. The more water it produces, the more it, it effectively uh, develops pneumonia. It chokes itself. So solutions to this, we can apply typical microscopy tools, right, to, uh, to try to understand um, what's going on. But this media is opaque, so we can only see the first, uh, the first few pores, you know, a few microns in. Um, but we can do some nice analysis, and we did. We got some nice work out of this, uh, basically, studying the, the transport in the native material. But again, what we really wanted to see was the dynamics inside this material. What, what, what produced these, these uh, pore patterns that we saw breaking through the surface and were ultimately influencing the fuel cell performance. So looking at the tools we have, uh, the microfluidic networks uh, made sense as a, as a possible um, way to study these things. So if you look at porous media, Right, you've got a set of pores. Lots of people have developed methods to study these things. You can put that in a perimeter, and you can get a distribution of the pore sizes. So you get a really good, um, you can get a really good uh, distribution, or knowledge of the different size of pores in the, in the media. And then you can go about making a chip. Right? So you get a computer algorithm here, and you, you, you make a chip that matches that pore distribution. And then you can image that chip using, using um, you can produce that chip using standard microfluidic techniques that are well developed. We have all the tools for that. And you can get that and you can study the transport. And you can see things that you couldn't see in the opaque material, right? You can see through transport dynamics. Other nice things you can do with, with PDMS, for instance, you can change the surface properties. So you can, you can turn the surface papers, properties of this and study a range of parameters that are not accessible to any other technique. So this, uh, this work was done by uh, Dr. Slava Berezhnov, who is now in, uh, in Dr. Lee's group uh, here at, uh, at Waterloo. So basically, you can, you can design a chip, all sorts of different aspects. This has a port size distribution matching a fuel cell material of interest, and then you can visualize, see the analysis. And you can analyze these in many, many ways, one of which is a fractal dimension, which is a useful measure for, uh, for, for the extent of flooding inside a fuel cell. So here's an example. You've got some standard chips up there, which look like the typical sort of biomedical style chip, but, uh, but here obviously a very different application. And, uh, and here's an example of the different contact angles. So a different, um, uh, for different um, surface conditions, we get very different wetting patterns, and that's what we expect. So we can tune the chip to match the wetting pattern of the material we're interested in. And, and that worked fairly well. So here's an example of sort of an output of maybe one um, run indicating the influence of the land area versus the channel area in the fuel cell. So looking back at some of this work, the, the two lessons that I come away with are that fluidics in energy applications can have impact in, in, in two ways. 
One is we can, we can win games where surface, vol surface area is important, right? Um, again, internal combustion, surface area, isn't what, what, uh, what uh, results in power. So that, that one's out. But in, but in, in process, electrochemical processes, for instance, and others, um, where surface, surface area is important, that's a game we can win with small scales. And the other one is we can look at existing, existing challenges in transport in porous media, and there's a lot of porous media in this world, uh, and we can use microfluidics, all the tools we developed to, to look at flows, right, to, and, and to develop chips and all, the, we can take all those tools and we can bring them to bear on problems in porous media. So looking ahead, Where are the big energy challenges? Challenges, pardon me. So I think it's useful to look at where our energy comes from in general. There's lots of, you know, I, I initially had some, even though I've been working in energy for years, I had some uh, confusion about how much comes from, you know, wind turbines, how much comes from, from nuke, and how much comes from fossil fuels and whatnot. So those of you familiar with the, with the area will know that this is the mix. Okay, from, from basic sources, this is where we get our, our power. And when I say we, I mean the world. So 4.5 terawatts is what we're burning on average as of 2009. <coughs> Oil, coal, and natural gas are the black, dark gray, and light gray um, plots here. So this is a pretty gray plot, right? So the fact of the matter is we get the bulk, almost 90% of our total energy from fossil fuels. Okay, interesting. It's good to know, right? It's good to know at least where we're at. Doesn't mean that wind isn't important. Doesn't mean that photovoltaics aren't important. But it means that these are here. This is what's keeping the lights on in this room. In Ontario, we've got a little bit more nuclear, a little bit more hydro too, than this mix would say. But, uh, but on a world basis, this is what we use. Okay, so. So fossil fuels are part of the picture. What are the challenges with fossil fuels? Well, there's a couple of them, right? One, one is the, you're taking carbon that's effectively sequestered in the ground quite nicely in the form of oil and coal. It's all down there, it's packed away. It's not in the atmosphere. You burn it and, and you produce uh, carbon dioxide. So that's a challenge. Carbon dioxide, of course, greenhouse gas and uh, is implicated in, in climate change and other concerns. So one possibility is to use fossil, is to replace fossil fuel with biofuel produced from sustainable sources. Biofuel has a bit of a dark cloud uh, hanging over it, right? Really the challenges can be boiled down to density and efficiency, right? There's been lots of money poured in in Canada and in the US into say corn ethanol. I mean, really the, the numbers in the end don't work out that favorable for that as, a, as an efficient undertaking, efficient way to get biofuel. So these are major challenges. Density is the other one. You can farm bacteria that produce biofuel, either by producing more bacteria or by producing it directly. But these things are at a large, large scale. And large scale, in general, for a small amount of power, that is, um, is, is, uh, is not profitable and it's not efficient. Other approaches, well, we can burn the fossil fuels we have and we can sequester the carbon in the ground. We can bury that stuff. And certainly there's, 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 um, there's some real, uh, potential for this technology. And in some ways it's been called a must work technology for the 21st um, century uh, because we do have so much fossil fuel and we are burning it. But there's a dark cloud here too, right? Cost, it's expensive. It's expensive to bury CO2 and safety, right? You've got these big balloons of CO2 underground. What if there was a leak? So questions around how do we do this and how do we do this uh, smartly in a safe manner, a cheap manner? For a microfluidics researcher, the maybe more personal question is, how do I, with my small scale tools, how do I make a significant impact here, right? It was obvious how I could make a nano sensor that could maybe detect cancer or something like that. That, that seemed to be more sent straightforward, but how do, I, how do I reconcile these huge difference in length scales here? Well, nature provides one example of how to do that, right? How did most of the Earth's oxygen uh, come to be? It's basically been processed by cyanobacteria, right? So those things aren't large-scale plants. Those are microfluidic, those are nanofluidic, okay? So 
nature produces on this scale using microfluidics and nanofluidics, primarily using photosynthesis. All right, so they take carbon dioxide, add some water, and you produce some, we'll call it biofuel in this case, and, and oxygen. Right? So this is the process nature uses. Can, can we crib from that and, uh, and produce fuel and consume CO2 uh, in, in, a, in a device in a practical way? Photosynthetic bacteria is where we started this project. There's different ways to, to do this. You can try looking at plant cells. Bacteria have lots of properties that are, that are um, uh, favorable for, for this type of thing. Uh, Blue-green algae, there's no saying that this isn't available uh, on Earth. It's very, very common. It's been active for 2.8 billion years. There's not too many things that have been around for that long. It's largely responsible for the oxygen on Earth. It uses a, two different uh, antennae inside here. And the important thing from a, from a scale perspective is that the photosynthesis, where does it occur? So this is about a micron wide in this particular uh, bacterium and five microns long. So the, the, the business end of this thing is in this layer here. Right? So it's in the, it's what's called a thylakoid membrane. And that's where the photosynthetic process occurs. So that's interesting. It's interesting because that's kind of reminiscent of a, of a surface-based thing. Right? So we think if we could feed that using our surface-based technology, stuff that microfluidics and nanofluidics is good at, maybe we, could, maybe we could do this on a practical scale. So current photobioreactors, bioreactors, let's have a look at those. Pond reactors, shown here on the left. This is basically you have a large open-scale pond, exactly what it looks like, and, uh, and you fill it full of bacteria. And these things are a little fussy. So the bacteria that's actually at the surface of the pond is getting too much light. This bacteria that's at, the, at, the, at a lower depth here is getting just the right amount. And then the stuff at the bottom is dark. It really can't, it can't see, uh, it doesn't get any light. So what you have to do here, the only strategy that works is to, is to just mix this up all the time. So that if you're a bacterium down here, at least every once in a while you'll get up through here, through this, through this perfect intensity point and you'll get some light that's useful, and you'll produce some biofuel, or you'll multiply. Tube reactors try to, try to fix that a little bit. So, okay, we're going to get some more surface area here. We're going we're to put these in tubes, and we're going to put the tubes out in the sun, and, and, uh, and then at least we'll have this ring around in the tube that's getting the perfect intensity. These guys are unhappy. They're getting too much. These guys aren't getting anything, but at least we're doing a little better than ponds, and that's true. The key point here is in both these technologies, only a very, very small number of bacteria, bacteria are the workers here, only a very, very small number of those bacteria are getting the incident light that's useful, right? Very dilute, very large operations, very dilute solutions. So that drives cost and essentially makes these technologies impractical. So enter the optofluidic reactor. If we could, if we could have a separate photo collection um, uh, unit photo collector and lots of people in electrical engineering and the photonic center are working on these lots of good examples of this and have optical control here then we could distribute the light using waveguides like fiber optics for instance in a more efficient way right and we could we could essentially give these bacteria what they want right and let's let's take that a step further on the inside if you remember the the, the cyanobacterium and other um, uh, other cyanobacteria, other than the S. elongatus I mentioned earlier, um, has the membrane on the outside, right? So we can picture taking um, uh, fiber optic waveguides and, and, uh, and coating them, right? Having, the, having the, the, uh, the bacteria on the outside of the waveguide where they, well, they'll receive the, the light. So in this sense, we're packing them tightly and, and keeping them happy. So that's the concept. The benefit is to, is to increase the, the light utilization, and that happens on the scale of the bacteria. So if you remember, this guy has, has, the, has, the, uh, has the surface active on the outside. Put that on the, on the waveguide, absorb it there, and you should get localized, you should be able to dry the local um, uh, photosynthetic process. The last, the last um, important aspect here is the use of evanescent light. So photo, uh, optics and waveguides have been used to, to distribute light within photobioreactors previously, and there's been a bunch of different clever strategies. But the concept here is to use the evanescent light field, and those familiar with sensors, nanosensors, be very familiar with evanescent light, right? So for instance, those, um, 
plasmonics, or SPR, when you detect things through uh, surface plasmon resonance, that's an evanescent field at the surface. That when, the, when the antibody comes down and sticks to the surface, it's seen through a change in the refractive index in the evanescent field. And that's why SPR is so popular, is because it's just used as an evanescent field. It doesn't sense what's going on in the bulk. It's very surface sensitive. So here, we're saying, well, we want to we put light at the surface, only to excite this, this membrane and locally excite bacteria. If we have diffuse light all over the place, this thing's going to grow bacteria in a, in a bulk process, and we won't be able to have fluid transport. So that's the concept. So on the scale of the bacteria, localizing the light on the scale of the bacteria um, increases light utilization. Distribution is on the scale of the reactor. So we use the same waveguides that are providing the light to the, to the bacteria, and we, we uh, basically fill the reactor with that, um, with that waveguide material separated by um, dis distances that are probably end up to be microfluidic on a practical level, uh, but the idea is to, is to get the fluid transport, bring in the, the water, right, and the carbon dioxide in solution, and bring out the fuel and the, um, and the oxygen. Neat ideas, all of them, but I think it's important to s ask yourself, and I, for me to ask myself, uh, the question, let's say, okay, Dr. Sin, let's say all of this works. Let's say all of that works. Let's say the photosynthetic material is excited by the evanescent field, which has never been shown before. Let's say that works. Let's say you can pack uh, a reactor up and you can generate these guys and they don't grow so much that they suffocate themselves. All those things, that, that all works. Why does it matter? Can you really, is it practical technology? How do the cost scenario um, work out? So we could look at the, the proportion of the volume, the plant volume utilization. So these are historically very big things. The ponds, right, take up a certain area, a certain volume. Tube reactors, same thing. They, uh, they're much more dense as far as the actual, the light delivery is better, the bacterial density is better, but the, uh, the scalability is poor. You have to spread these things out like fences over a large area. So the amount of area that's taken up in a plant that's used by the bacteria is very small. Compare with the optofluidic reactor, which we can get, essentially you've got to make some room for some waveguides, have to make some room for some transport, but we can really pack them in. So if there's one thing you can take away from this, I want you to remember that the, the strategy is to pack the bacteria in and keep them happy. Okay? Give them what they need and pack in the density. And if you do that, you can achieve many orders of magnitude increase, I guess it's four here, between three and four orders of magnitude increase in density. So now you've taken a technology that's too big to be practical. You've condensed it by a thousand times or more. Now you've got a block of bacteria that could produce practical volumes. So that's why, in addition to the concepts and the ideas I showed earlier, that's why we're moving forward on this. So step one is to develop an optofluidic chip that can, that can serve as a test bed for this. Of course, when, you're only, uh, when your only tool is a hammer, I guess all your problems look like nails, right? So, so we know how to do optofluidics, we know how to do waveguides, lots of things. So, so uh, very recently, in collaboration with the Ericsson Group and using the Cornell um, Nanofab, we produced a nice optofluidic, pardon me, optofluidic chip here um, with the, that, that can, in a very controlled manner, um, study this, this process and we can do a proof of concept. So that's, that's ongoing work. This is going to be neat and if it works it's going to produce a really nice paper, but it's not scalable. No one's going to, same problem with the microfluidic chips, right? No one's going to want to build a, a plant out of, uh, out of these optofluidic chips. It's not going to be practical. Can't afford it. So the optofluidic fiber reactor we're developing at the same time. So this is using, there's a very um, there's, a, there's precedent for large-scale uh, fabrication of waveguides. Of course, it's the internet, right? So fiber optic is really cheap. Um, so we can build reactors that are going to basically at least show that we could scale this technology. Um, waveguides on a chip aren't going to do it, but fiber optics could. That technology was a device that was enabled by microfluidics. So if we, if we step through what we've, what we've learned so far, we had microfluidic fuel cells. That's an energy application that was made possible by microfluidics. Then we took microfluidic methods, chips, and we studied transport processes and porous media. 
On the, on the biofuel side, we developed a device, an optofluidic device, either a bunch of um, fiber optics or a waveguide chip that could produce, it was a device that could produce biofuel. That's the concept. On the studying transport media side, there's a, what I think is an important problem in, in carbon management that we can address. So you may have heard of Carbon Management Canada. It's, a, it's an NC, NCE that was funded in, in 2009, 50 researchers from across Canada, some of which here at Waterloo. And, and the idea is to, is to invest in research in, in understanding carbon transport and more broadly carbon issues in Canada. Canada's got a real carbon problem. And, uh, and this is a, a, a large center to address that. So my little piece of that is a five, uh, a five university effort to look at uh, carbon transport. And, and, and the idea is to use our, small, use our tools, our small scale testing systems, microfluidics and nanofluidics to understand, better understand carbon dioxide transport in these processes. So underground in oil seams, right, in uh, reservoirs, pardon me, and, and in, in places where they want to sequester carbon, like in carbonates, uh, limestone formations in Alberta. There's tremendous formations there that could take a lot of CO2. And, but the questions are, how is the CO2 transport, what, what temperatures and pressures should we inject it at, what injection points, what depths to get effective um, transport and reaction of the CO2, and how long does it stay there? So that's the need. Accurate CO2 transport properties in these various mediums, both porous media and in, for instance, heavy oils. The, the current way to do that is using PVT cell, and this is, this is a nice technology. It's been around a long time, but there are some challenges with it. One, you can't really multiplex this to look at very many conditions. The other aspect is you can't control the interface. If you're interested for how much CO2, if I take CO2 and pump it into a reservoir, how much is going to go in? What's, if I'm going to model, what's the interfacial area there? Well, here you have no control over that. That's something in microfluidics and nanofluidics we have, we, we're, we're good at, right? We can control interface shape. We can control conditions. CO2 is injected in these things at incredibly pressure, incredible pressures and temperatures, supercritical fluid. That's another aspect that microfluidics and nanofluidics is very, is very good at. So the concept is to develop these chip-based technologies for the study of, of uh, transporting in um, fluids of, of interest, heavy oil, for instance, and, in, uh, and um, in the porous media. So this chip on the left is just a mock-up. You can picture uh, doing transmission measurements here of the CO2 transport into the heavy oil under different conditions. And, uh, and you can picture doing sort of solubility testing in, in similar um, established methods like this two-phase chip here. So regarding collaborations and personnel, lots of people have worked on this. Uh, most important collaborators I should mention is Dr. Jalali and Dr. Harrington in the University of Victoria. More, some, of the, some of the more recent stuff, particularly the optophilic waveguide work that we're doing um, is with Dr. Erickson's group, of course, as well as that, uh, the next generation uh, fuel cell. That's his, his student, Sean Wirtz, working on that. It's a very nice technology. Amy Bazalak is a professor at, at Toronto now. Eric is a professor at uh, Simon Fraser. Uh, John's at Toronto now, and, and, uh, and, and uh, Slava is here at Waterloo. These are our uh, funding sources for, uh, for the energy stuff, and I thank you for your attention. No, it's, yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question. That comes about from, let's see if I can go back here. The, those two streams are, are flowing together. So in a basic fuel cell, if we turn up the flow rate, it's gonna take me a little while to click through here. Maybe I'll, oops. Here we go, that's better. Um, So these two streams are, are flowing together, right? So if we turn up the flow rate, we get better performance because this boundary layer thins right down, right? Um, but what happens is, of course, the amount of fuel we're actually using here is very, very little. So you could picture this green stream here would be very almost solid green at the outlet. Whereas if we reduce the flow rate, we get less power, less transport here, but we'd be throwing away less fuel. Does that make sense? So you picture a classic tea mixer if, you, if you're with reactive sidewalls. If, if you pump the flow really quickly, then you get just straight two streams, perfect streams. 
And, um, but if you reduce the flow, then you get more, more diffusion, more reaction. In this case, you're right in the sense that, the, that you do, there's a limit on how far you could slow it down due to diffusion between the two streams. But the high flow limit, the reason why you don't get good utilization at high flow rates is because you're just throwing it out the back here. It's not getting a chance to react. Thanks for the question. Do we still have time for uh, questions? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Optical fiber. What's yeah. the issue with fouling? Fouling. That's a good question. The, um, I guess the, the short answer is we're not sure. Uh, the, the better answer is, in some sense, we want, we want fouling, right? We want these bacteria to stick to the surface. That would be the most, the, the best route for, for light transmission, evanescent light from the waveguide surface only um, under one micron, basically a wavelength of light, directly into that layer uh, on the outside of the, of, the, of the photosynthetic bacteria. So in, some, in, a, in a sense, we do want fouling. We do want the bacteria to stick to the waveguide. But you want, the, you want the process to be specific, right? You don't want other stuff growing there and stuck there. So that could be biofiling issues. The other aspect, which, which I think will be a concern, is, is um, if we've got these, this, this array of fibers, and there's bacteria absorbed on the, on the outside, um, in the ideal scenario where it's just the evanescent wave there, that's perfect. Because even, even 10 microns away from the surface, it's perfectly black perfectly dark. So we won't have any growth in there. There'll still be, there'll still be lots of room for microfluidic transport between the fibers. It won't, it won't foul up the entire reactor, become a solid block of bacteria that can no longer take uh, CO2, right? That, so that's, that's the concept. How well that works will depend on how well we, we, we have the, the waveguides and how little scattered light there is, as opposed to evanescent light. We'll see. <laughs> Uh, one of your graphs, uh, I guess if I remember correctly, uh, I noticed for this uh, microfluidic fuel cell, the more you push the size down, the better performance you get, right? Yes, so in, um, maybe I can go along here and you can tell me. Uh, the early ones? Actually, there's one here, I can, I can get to the one with all the geometries on it. Okay, so which, which one are you thinking of here? Uh, this was just the basic one, the one that you okay. just yeah. the parallel flows. Yeah. Yeah, so what's stopping you to the, like, pushing it uh, further down? I noticed you said it was between yeah. 50 to 150. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good question. So could you just reduce this? Uh, this, this geometry here um, is more awkward. If you reduce this distance here between these two, then you're going to get increased mixing here between fuel and oxygen at the same time you're increasing transport to your, to your cell. So that's not positive. But here, you're quite right. You could, you could decrease this dimension and maintain this dimension, right? So your question is, what's the limit? How, how low can you go there? And, and what limits that is the, is the ohmic resistance. So you still need to get protons through the solution, right? So if they have a, if they have a very um, tortuous path, or a thin, uh, a thin conductor here, essentially, the, the, the fluid is the conductor, then that's what limits that, ultimately. But, but certainly, in the early days, um, uh, 2005, 2006, that was one strategy that, that we got some uh, utility out of, was decreasing that height, keeping, those, keeping, those, um, uh, keeping that diffusion between the two streams minimized. Yeah, you can get to, it's a rough number, you get to about 50% 50 uh, fuel utilization with that strategy without too much trouble, you can't get uh, far beyond that. You can't get to 90, 100%. Yeah, I'll take, a, yeah, I'll take a two more questions. Yeah. Uh, is the amount of transporting CO2 to these bacteria? Because uh, in the real world, they use that CO2 from gas and also to the surface of the oceans, I think. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a good question. How do you get the CO2 in there, assuming it's in gaseous form when you get a hold of it? It probably is. Um, yeah, let me just find the right diagram here to show you. So, 
So the, I, don't have a, I don't have a great diagram, but in these cases, what they do, so in, in existing cases, they bubble CO2 through a central, a central vat before they put it through the tubes, right? And in another reactor I didn't show here, because it's not practical on huge scales, it's called an airlift reactor. Has anyone here heard of an airlift reactor? It's probably more of a, it's more of a bio thing. But there's a lot, you, you'd recognize that you saw one in a lab. It's basically a tube-based thing. You, and you put a CO2 injection at the bottom, and then of course the bubbles, uh, buoyancy, and they induce a flow. So this is a way to introduce CO2, much the way we bubble solutions with oxygen or nitrogen and other things, par parging. That's essentially the, 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 the way the reactor works. So the concept here is that we'd use that same strategy. We'd enter CO2 through the bottom, and, and it would bubble up here, right? And it would generate a general circulation. So the CO2 would dissolve into the into the fluid, and then it's dissolved CO2 that goes into bacteria. Same thing happens in nature, right? So the bacteria don't, don't hang out near the surface and get their CO2 directly that way. It's CO2 in the, in the ocean or um, cyanobacteria are also active in freshwater environments, so in, in, in the lake, same thing, through, through, the, through the solution. And ultimately, the oxygen would be the same way, into the solution and then ultimately bubbled out. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. For the membrane less uh, fuel cell, you got the maximum power of 150 milliwatts. Yeah, that's something like that, yeah. What's the potential of the like, let's say, 1.4% bonds or? Per centimeter squared? Yeah, it's getting there, right? So I would say you need um, another order of magnitude, and you'd really be, you'd really be doing it. Um, because then you'd be, you'd be ahead of, of hydrogen. The, and you would have some of the, some of the issues. Um, I would say I would say another another two times if you double it, I think I think you're getting into uh, into an area where, where it could be it could be profitable. Yep. Are close to that or? Yeah, I think it's possible. I think it's possible with this. So we're coming up. So I'm a transport guy. You can probably see that coming through the the presentation. That's 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 what I can I can improve when I, and I see a technology right. So we've done a lot of that. What's the next stage? There's, there's an ohmic resistance problem that we haven't addressed. And th this new cell that we're working on now addresses that to some degree. So it's, those other, it's picking up those other pieces. And I, I, from my experience so far, you know, the technology has advanced a lot. I don't think two times is, 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 uh, is, uh, is, is uh, unreasonable. I think there's probably easily that much stuff that could be improved. I just have one last question you know, I'll to ask and I will finish it. Sure. Great, thanks. Go ahead. So what's the typical lifespan of this bacteria on optical fibers? And like, if, if they die, like, what happens and how, how often do you have to like, uh, put the new bacteria on optical fibers? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. So excited ever, evanescently, uh, we don't know. But, but can, be, can be, you know, days to months, depending on the conditions. Right? So, and, and in some cases, longer than that. So we'll see. Um, the, the, how, that, how well that works. The other question is, you know, so you have a dead one on there, uh, how does it get removed? Does it get removed? Yeah, so those are, those are important questions. One, one concept I've thought of in connection to that would be, uh, again, with energy stuff, it has to be simple. I mean, it can't be, I can't have an optical tweezer going on and taking those guys off. Right? It's got to be something simple if it's going to be a large scale technology. So you can picture, if you had this, if you had this block, right, this one meter cubed, of optical fiber, polymer fiber, wound through this, tightly through this, this volume. You could picture a plate that, that is sort of a floss type mechanism, right? That you, that you you'd press down. So basically in between all the fibers, there's a plate with holes in it that would basically clean it off. So you could picture something like that that would rejuvenate the surface and you'd have to start over. That's one concept. I, ideally, uh, there's a biochemical route to, to having them desorb or something. That would be nice. If not, uh, we can do a mechanical solution. It's a good question. Yeah, this text of the uh, is very nice.